on July the 2nd, 1997 in Normandy, John Griffin reported the disappearance of his 23-year-old daughter, Elizabeth. The University of Rouen chemistry student had been missing for 10 days. The following day, her car was found in the car park of a housing estate about 50 kilometers from her home. The car doors were open and her handbag was inside. In the bag were two bits of paper, one with Jean-Yves Morel's phone number on it and another with Fred, 24 June, 10 a.m. scribbled on it. A full-scale inquiry was launched and the police summoned thousands of Freds and Fredericks and interviewed hundreds of residents from the estate where the car was found, as well as all of Elizabeth's contacts. Still nothing. After three and a half months of investigating, they had just one lead left to try, the man whose telephone number was found in her bag. Jean-Yves Morel was a regular 33-year-old family man. Elizabeth had met this lab technician a year earlier, during a work placement at the factory where he worked. Investigators had discovered a troubling coincidence. Morel's young sister-in-law, Marilyn, had also gone missing the year before. On October 9th, 1997, Morel is taken to the police station at Notre-Dame de Gravenchon. He arrives in a car. It's 9 a.m. and his 48 hours in custody has begun. Custody is a measure of constraint imposed by a police detective on someone who's suspected of committing or attempting to commit a crime or an offense. In France, it lasts a maximum of 48 hours. This 48-hour period in custody has been reconstructed by actors based on police interviews. Do you swear to tell the truth and nothing but the truth? Of course. Why do you ask me that? This procedure, Mr. Morel. Can you state your name, and date and place of birth? And then tell us about your family. My name is Jean-Yves Morel. I was born 4th of January 1965 in Dieppe. My father is a chemistry lecturer at the universities in Rouen and Le Havre, and my mother was a teacher. She's retired now. I've also got two sisters. One is a doctor and the other is a computer scientist. Are you married? Yes, I got married on 4th of September 1995 to Nadine Rousset. And we have a daughter who is nearly one. She was born last November and I spend a lot of time looking after her. I'm observing him. He is passive, calm and confident. He doesn't seem emotional or wound up. He's very calm. We were trying to figure out what sort of person this man was. Jean-Yves Morel was very cautious, waiting for us to finish asking the questions to make sure he understood it correctly. All of his answers were perfectly plausible. A police interview is like a piece of theatre. Where do you do your shopping? You've got to adapt your approach to be more or less diplomatic or brutal, depending on who is sitting opposite you. What about your studies, your qualifications? I studied economics and social sciences at school, and for the past 11 years, I've worked for a lab in Lillebonne. I'm a lab technician, and I like my job. Do you have any contact with the interns in your job? Oh, yes. Regular contact. I get on very well with some of them. I've even invited some of them back to my house. I'm thinking of Mikhail, for instance, and Thomas and Elizabeth Griffin. And do you have a good relationship with your family? Yes, very good. What about your neighbours? We have a very good relationship with our neighbours. We share the same philosophy. We stay on good terms, but we don't invite one another around. Jean-Yves Morel is Mr. Average. He's an ordinary guy. He visits his parents-in-law and his family in general. He goes out with his wife and his daughter from time to time. He didn't have a suspicious profile. He had a profile of your average guy. He's Mr. Perfect. It was very surprising. Can you tell me what cars you drive? Yes, we've got two cars, a Peugeot 250 GRD and a Range Rover. My wife drives the Peugeot and I drive the Range Rover. I've also got a motorbike. We noticed that Morel liked expensive things. He didn't buy... He had an expensive mountain bike, for example, and a sailing boat. You could say he was living beyond his means. 
pouvait presque considérer qu'il vivait au-dessus de ses moyens. There, sign the bottom of each page. During the first interview, the first four hours, we didn't find out much about his personality. He was quite reserved and calm. He took his time to answer our questions. We only scratched the surface. Is this your first motorbike, or have you had others? No, when... The way Daniel Garou and I usually conduct these interviews is to say, that's the first part over and done with, let's discuss it and then change the subject. In this case, with Morel, we discussed motorbikes, Range Rovers and the various sports he's into. Ah, yes, I see, great. It relaxes the interviewee and means that they are less guarded and more likely to respond truthfully to our questions. We also need to do a handwriting test. Mm -hmm. Did Morel write the note found in Elizabeth's car? A handwriting test should establish that, one way or another. This sample will be taken to a handwriting expert while he's still in custody. We hope to get a rapid response before the 48 hours is up, so that we can confront Morel with the result. When and how did you find out that Elizabeth Griffin had gone missing? One of your colleagues from Saint Romain de Colbos police station told me. He asked me whether I had heard from Elizabeth. I was shocked to hear that she had gone missing. In my family, we've had to deal with the disappearance of my sister-in-law, so I know how Mr. Griffin feels. He must be suffering terribly. It's the not knowing that's the worst. The aim is to get him to talk. He's speaking unprompted now, telling us about Marilyn. He's trying to find out whether we've made the connection between the two cases. We let it come from him. Morel has been placed in custody because there have been not just one, but two disappearances among his circle of acquaintances, Elizabeth and also Marilyn one year earlier. Marilyn Rosset was Morel's wife's younger sister. She was only 17 when she vanished into thin air on April 5, 1996, after visiting the couple. Investigators concluded that she'd run away but there seem to be some worrying similarities between the two cases. The two girls both disappeared in the same region. They both knew Morel and both left notes, so there were similarities between the two cases. I had photos on my desk of Marilyn Roussy and Elizabeth Griffin, and when I placed them side by side, I realized the two girls resembled one another physically. We put the photos up in the meeting room, and the resemblance was uncanny. People kept thinking they were the same person. Chief Inspector Alanique took Jean-Yves Morel's statement when Marilyn disappeared. Twenty years on, she can still remember interviewing him. Mr. Morel had this regrettable habit of staring at my breasts. Whenever he looked at me, I felt uncomfortable. I couldn't look him in the eye. I had never experienced that before. As soon as the interview was over, I referred him to my superiors. When we interviewed Morel during his time in police custody, we focused on Elizabeth's disappearance. It wasn't our place, in the context of this particular case, to interview Morel about Marilyn's disappearance. Despite the suspicion heaped on Jean-Yves Morel, the investigators haven't got enough evidence to charge him in connection with his two disappearances. Those who have been in close contact with him, namely my colleague and the chief investigator, are convinced that it was him. But we have nothing so far to implicate Jean-Yves Morel in the disappearance of Elizabeth Griffin. That's the problem. We might have some interesting theories, but we have no actual proof. And we are hampered by the absence of a crime scene. So, we need a confession. But a detailed confession, backed up by hard facts. A simple confession won't get us any. The only clue investigators have is the number of phone calls made between Jean-Yves Morel and Elizabeth Griffin. During the second interview, 
After five hours in custody, the police officers will try to uncover the true nature of their relationship. When did you first meet Elizabeth Griffin? I first met Elizabeth in the middle of August 1996. I had just come back from my holiday to find her working at the lab as an intern for the summer. As a lab technician, do you have any contact with the interns? Yes, and I'm not a conceited or disdainful person, so we soon started talking. That's what happened with Elizabeth. We talked about chemistry and we shared tips. I remember eating out with her a couple of times at a restaurant in Lillebon. And once in a brasserie in Notre-Dame de Gravenchamp with my colleague Barthélemy. His responses always sound plausible because he refers to people he knows, members of his family or colleagues. And did you stay in touch with Elizabeth after her internship? Why do you ask me that? I just want to know if you kept in touch with her. Do you mind me asking? No. In this first phase of the interrogation, we start asking detailed questions, such as where exactly. That makes him suspicious. Why are you asking me that? He wants to know what we have in our files before answering our questions. It was in October or November. She phoned me one evening at home. I remember my wife was in the living room. She was at home and she overheard our conversation. I was answering questions about a chemistry problem, but I also arranged to meet her at the Breaute train station a few days later. Why the train station? I'm a very punctual person. I don't like waiting. I don't like being late either. I knew what time her train arrived from Rouen, so I arranged to meet her as she got off her train. My wife was with me. She was pregnant at the time. Our dog Jimmy was there as well. Right. Too much detail is suspicious. There are too many facts. No way would you remember what you were doing in so much detail after three or four months. That, that's impossible. He seems so rigid about his timetable. He arranged to meet Elizabeth at such and such a time. He was always ahead of the game. He's extremely meticulous. It was January or February. She phoned me because she wanted me to return the lecture notes she'd lent me. She had a lot of work. She was snowed under. She had a very full timetable. This technique was very simple. He tried to make out that he was just friends with her, said he liked her a lot, that he was helping her with her chemistry studies. It was all a way of exonerating himself, saying, I had no reason to hurt this girl because I was helping her. So he makes out that he was her protector. Looking back, I think she was anxious. She wanted to do well in her exams so she could be financially independent. I think she said that if she failed her exams, her father would stop paying her allowance. Did she say that? No, she didn't exactly say that, but that's the impression I got, and I became increasingly convinced of it the more I spoke to her on the phone and met up with her. No one could confirm whether or not Elizabeth had fallen out with her family or had issues with a boyfriend or anxieties about her studies, which would lead to her father stopping her allowance. She never mentioned her mother, but I found out from colleagues that her mother committed suicide. Apart from that, she only ever talked about work. I felt the stress mounting. She lacked motivation and needed support. He describes her as being fragile, perhaps even suicidal, by implying that she might have killed herself. He's once again trying to exonerate himself. Do you think Elizabeth killed herself? I don't know. Do you know where she lives? Did you ever go to her house? Yes. Twice. I posted her lecture notes through her letterbox. The second time, I hand-delivered them. That was in her studio flat in Rouen. She invited me in. We were wondering whether he had been at her home or whether their relationship had been purely professional. The investigators have lifted traces of unidentified DNA from Elizabeth's flat, for instance, from a bottle of orange juice. They're hoping it matches Morel's DNA. Unfortunately for the investigators, it turns out that the DNA results weren't a match for Morel. And further hopes were dashed when it transpired that the handwriting test results also came back negative. 
The handwriting expert didn't reckon that Morel had written the note that said, Fred, 24th of June, 10 a.m. Obviously, we were somewhat discouraged by the news. Searching Elizabeth Griffin's flat didn't help us to determine whether there was any sort of relationship between her and Jean-Yves Morel. Whenever he went to Rouen, he always had an excuse and a justification. But could it have been to go and see Elizabeth? Was it to stalk her? At the moment, we don't know. Mr. Morel, how would you describe your sex life? I've had a healthy sex life ever since I was a teenager. I've had about 10 sexual partners, and I've always been faithful to my wife. What about in your marriage? We are perfectly compatible. I think we both experience sexual fulfillment. Our feeling here is that he's being too polite, to be honest. By his age, he must have had some experience in his life that didn't go quite so smoothly. In the office next door, Jean-Yves Morel's wife, Nadine, is also being interviewed. She describes her husband as stay at home and their relationship as nothing out of the ordinary. Morel seems so well behaved. He has no criminal record and his life appears to have gone without hitches. His marriage, exemplary. He didn't really come across as a potential criminal. After more than eight hours in custody, the investigators are no closer to finding Morel guilty of the crime. In the next interview, they're going to focus their questions on the date Elizabeth went missing. Our investigations since the case was opened have led us to believe that Elizabeth disappeared on the 24th of June. So, Morel's next interview will be directed towards his movements on that particular day. On June 24th, I got up at the same time as my wife, at 6.30 a.m., because I had a stomachache. I didn't feel well. I got dressed for work, but I didn't feel up to it, so I phoned the lab and told them I was afraid I wouldn't be coming in. Did you go out that morning? No, I didn't go out, on foot, on my motorbike, or in the car. And later? My wife came back at 12.30, we had lunch together, then she went back out again at 2.45 p.m. Meanwhile, I phoned my colleague, Denis, to tell him I wouldn't be able to make it to the swimming pool. Pretending he had a stomach bug, assuming he did kill Elizabeth, is another way of throwing us investigators off the scent. It's a cunning ploy because it means he can say he cancelled all of his appointments without having to prove anything. He was sick, so he stayed at home. And that was that. What time did your wife get home? The same as usual. At 6.30 p.m. I went to pick up my daughter from the childminder, and we spent the evening together. I didn't go to work the next day either. Right. So apart from picking up your daughter, you didn't go out at all on the 24th or the 25th? No, definitely not. According to your bank statement, you wrote a cheque for 99 francs on the 24th to your barber in Lillebon. So you must have gone out on the 24th, Mr. Morel, despite what you just said. I honestly don't remember going to my barber's in Lillebon on the 24th. Don't play games with us, Mr. Morel. You remember telephoning your colleague to cancel a trip to the swimming pool, but you don't remember going to the barber's? He kept changing his version of events. You can see he's thinking it through, looking at us to see how we react. I said to him, don't agonise over it, Mr. Morel. Just tell us exactly what you did. You're giving me a different version every time, Mr. Morel. Just tell us exactly what happened on the 24th of June. You can see that Morel's personality won't allow him to do that. There's no point in pushing him. Him raising his voice alarmed him. He's the sort to just clam up. I think the reason you're getting muddled about dates and what you're doing is because you're making the whole thing up, Mr. Morel. Am I right? 
On June 24, I didn't leave the house. I didn't go to the barber. As far as I can remember, I didn't phone anyone and I didn't receive any calls. It's amazing that he held out so long in custody without cracking up. Only innocent people and hardened criminals can do that. Depending on their personality, hardened criminals can hold out for a very long time, as long as they are in control. All through the night, in a fourth and then a fifth interview, police detectives questioned the detainee unrelentingly about his movements on June the 24th. Despite a few inconsistencies, Morel stuck to his version of events. The next morning, after 23 hours in custody and having had no rest, police officers confronted Jean-Yves Morel with new evidence found during a search of his home. Can you tell us what's in these cardboard boxes and whether their contents belong to you? Yes, they are porn videos and they belong to me. Those are my cassettes. Do you know how many there are? No, nope, I've never counted them. There are 140 cassettes, three boxes full. If you say so. Do you know where we found them? I can hazard a guess. When we searched Morel's house, we discovered a locked door to the attic. When we opened that door, we found the necessary equipment for watching porn videos and a pile of porn magazines. It's very rare when we're carrying out our searches for us to find 140 porn videos all belonging to one individual. It only ever happens with filmmakers or people who work in the porn industry. 140 is a lot. He must be a collector, a compulsive collector. It shows that there is another side to Mr. Average here, behind the calm, smooth exterior. Compulsive types often act on their compulsions. I had a reaction that was strangely physical. I felt this emotion spread from the tips of my toes to the ends of my hair. I had a feeling that this was our man. This was the guy we'd been looking for. It reinforced our suspicions that these two missing girls had been sexually assaulted. What about the books and the magazines? Yes, they're mine as well. The books are mine. Is there a problem with the magazines? When questioned on the subject, Mrs. Morel said she didn't know of the existence of that room. She had no access to the attic. We gradually came to realise just how submissive she was. It wasn't until she spoke to us that she found out that they were crippled with debt. There were considerable sums of money being spent, leading to huge debt. We found Nadine to be a very frank young woman with a straightforward manner, someone who had nothing to hide, whereas the personality of Jean-Yves Morel was infinitely more complex. You know, I've had time to think about things in more detail, and I'm now sure that the two days I had off work were actually in the week before the 24th and the 25th of June. To avoid a more difficult conversation, he goes back to talking about what he was doing on the 24th of June. He doesn't want us to linger on the subject to porn videos, so he goes back to talking about June the 24th and introduces new elements. We try to make it crack. Mr. Morel, stop going back over what you've already told us. Tell us what happened with Elizabeth Griffin. Did you try to seduce her? Did she turn you down? Did that make you angry? Not at all. Why do you say that? I never once made a move on Elizabeth. But Mr. Morel, you're partial to a bit of that. It's obvious. We've seen your collection of porn videos and magazines. It's time to explain yourself. Tell us the truth will be a relief, Mr. Morel. Tell us the truth. It will be a relief. Because everyone has a need to tell the truth. There comes a time when it's a relief to tell the truth, rather than have it preying on your mind. And you see him hesitate. You think he's going to do it. He's going to confess. You know, Morel, you're not going to get away with this in court. I'm pretty sure you'll end up getting the maximum sentence. If you tell us straight what happened, I'm not saying you won't go to prison, 
But I think the jury will be more lenient with you. Et je pense que vous bénéficierez de la clémence du jury. Go on, Mr. Morel. That's when he comes up. After 24 hours in custody without any convincing results, it's time to rethink the approach. For this sixth interview, we consulted the examining magistrate. He was overseeing the investigation. He is responsible for the case. We filled him in on what we had discovered and what Morel was saying. Given the evidence against me, he said yes. I understand. You need to continue interrogating him. I'll extend the custody period by another 24 hours. We hope Morel will crack now we've got new evidence. The interview about his movements on the 24th of June went a bit awry, but we think we can still get him to confess as time goes on. But the investigators don't interview Morel straight away they decide to place him in a cell. When we place him in the cell, we sense that he's pissed off. He's sore. He's only dressed in his pants. So he feels vulnerable. But we think, let's see what five hours in a cell does for him. During this break, which will last until the morning, Lieutenant Frottier, the other chief investigator, observes Morel. I stayed in the police station, kept an eye on him. He didn't sleep. He didn't take a moment to calm down and rest. He was totally focused. That's when you think. He's thinking things through. Our technique has worked. He's sure to give us the true version of events, which will be a relief for everyone. I'm going to try to tell you what I know. I didn't say anything before, because I was worried you'd suspect me. But I deliberately omitted telling you that I saw Elizabeth after June 16th. Where did you see her? And when? It was on Friday the 27th of June at 4pm. I parked the car in the car park at Lillebonne Town Hall. I crossed the street to walk along the pavement, and my attention was drawn to two girls who were walking arm in arm. My eyes met those of one of the girls, and I saw that it was Elizabeth. As soon as Elizabeth saw me, they turned and fled. Is this some kind of a joke, Mr. Morel? Elizabeth Griffin disappeared on the 24th of June. No one she knows has seen her or heard from her since that day. And suddenly, as if by magic, you saw her on the 27th of June in Lillebonne. He's a nasty piece of work. This is the pit. He's sending us off on a false trail we won't be able to check out in a hurry. It's just not possible. It's not true. It's another lie. We take time out to think about it and to analyse things. And we realise that we're at an impasse and that Morel has played a good card. Yet again, he has bought himself more room to breathe. He's saying, there, while you chew on that bone, I'll be left in peace. We are obliged to go to Lillemont to check whether Elizabeth was spotted there after the date of her disappearance. Since this will take several days to check out, and they can only keep him in custody for another 12 hours, the police officers decide to suspend his custody. It is a strategic choice. We don't want to forfeit the remaining time, so we talk to the magistrate and get him to temporarily suspend the custody. Legally, it's possible to suspend a period of custody and resume it weeks, months, even years later. As long as it doesn't exceed 48 hours in total. Early that evening, Jean-Yves Morel leaves the police station a free man. We saw him get into his Range Rover. He looked like a kid climbing into a toy car at the fairground. He was so happy to be leaving. We stood at the window and watched him drive off to his home. My colleague and I said to one another, he'll be back. He's won the first round.
Of course, the checks undertaken in Lillebon do not confirm Elizabeth's presence there on that day. Unsurprisingly, we found no trace of her having been there after the day she went missing. During the months following this period in custody, Morel was placed under telephone surveillance. We had cause to tail him on a couple of occasions, but he never really stepped out of line. He went back to being Mr. Ornery. As time went on and the investigators doubled their efforts, there was a feeling of hostility. Some investigators felt that we were persecuting Morel, who might even be innocent, and we were hounding him and his family a bit too much. The mayor even got involved because Morel informed him that he was being harassed by the police. So the mayor turned up, asking us to lay off Morel a bit because his was an exemplary family and he'd be amazed if Morel was a criminal. We didn't get discouraged because Elizabeth had almost become part of our family. She was a brave girl who had embraced life and made plans for the future, so much so that we never believed she'd just gone missing. What's more, I had a daughter the same age as her. I think that provided a, an added motivation. The police were increasingly convinced that they needed incontestable material evidence to catch Morel out. Without that, he would never crack. The best irrefutable proof would be the discovery of the victim's corpse. Bodies are difficult to hide. So far, no bodies have been found in the region or elsewhere that could belong to the victim. No bodies have washed up in the Seine or in the sea, which wasn't far away. We're convinced he must have had a hard time getting rid of the body because we've checked out his movements and he didn't have much time to play with. And we know for a fact that you need a fair bit of time to get rid of a body. We decided the easiest place would be his home. His property is quite big. It's a detached house with a garage and a bit of land. We concluded that the body was at Morel's home, on his land. Also, Mr. Griffin received a telephone call from one of Morel's neighbours, telling him that Morel had been doing some work on his land. That tied in with our thinking and made us decide to proceed with the search. Ten months after Elizabeth went missing, in the early hours of April the 28th, 1998, the examining magistrate authorized a large number of police officers to turn up at Jean-Yves Morel's house. Armed with a GPR, the first time one was used in France, they probed the basement of his property. Late that night, after a decisive discovery, the police took Jean-Yves Morel back into custody. They only had 12 hours left to interrogate him. For procedural purposes, you need to tell us what happened yesterday after we arrived at your house at 7 a.m. The interview is conducted by Richard Vepierre, who's heading up the investigation. Yesterday, on Tuesday 28th of April, you turned up at my house at 7 a.m. You wanted to search my property and its outbuildings. I cooperated with the whole operation. Morel invited us in. He wasn't at all phased. Do what you need to do, gentlemen. Morel was so relaxed about inviting us in that we found it hard to remain suspicious. We thought, perhaps we're wrong after all. This can't be right. He wouldn't be like this if he had a body buried on his property. The first results soon showed that there was a suspicious area in my garage where I usually keep my boat. They led us to a spot where there had been a lot of movement in the earth. 
There were some suspicious anomalies and something akin to a tomb. We started digging with tools we had at hand, shovels, a crowbar, etc. So you dug down about one meter and came across a slab of concrete. Do you remember saying several times over, you can break up the slab, there's nothing underneath it? Yes, I remember. Certain they would find a body under the concrete, the police decided to break up the slab. They thought it would only be a few centimeters thick. The surprise was that it took forever, because instead of 10 centimeters of concrete, there were 90 centimeters. Once we'd destroyed the slab, we found what was essentially beaten earth. And we had a sense of total failure. We said to one another, I don't believe this. There was nothing there. At this point, Morel's attitude remained unchanged. He didn't say as much, but in his head, I think he must have been jubilant at the thought that we were going to have to stop. What is the psychological explanation of this aura of calm? It's because he's a pervert and he's challenging the investigators to prove that he's guilty. He feels considerable satisfaction at seeing all of these people searching and digging and turning his house upside down. He's saying, I bet you won't find it. Look at me. Can you imagine a guy like me digging a hole this deep to bury a body? Surely not. This guy carried on digging up the earth and going through it with a fine tooth comb. Suddenly, the triangular corner of a black plastic bag appeared. The sort used by local farmers. Then one of my investigators jumped into the hole. And I followed suit. He took out a Stanley knife and cut the bag open. It gave off a foul smell. The sort investigators are used to encountering, unfortunately, whenever they uncover a body. It was awful. And that's when we realized that this was it. We had our corpse. You asked me, who is it? And I replied, it's Elizabeth. At that moment, or soon afterwards, we asked him, what about Marilyn? He said, no, Marilyn wasn't me. It happened on Tuesday, 24th of June, at about 11 a.m. Elizabeth turned up unannounced. She had come to complain because she still hadn't been offered an internship for the summer. He's less calm, but he's still lying. I told her that it takes time and said I'd make inquiries for her, but she didn't believe me. She said I hadn't tried hard enough to persuade them at the lab. She raised her voice. And then she said she didn't think my wife would be too pleased to find out that we'd been seeing one another so often. Morel is acknowledging the facts, but on his own terms, presenting himself more as a victim than a perpetrator. I tried to show her out, saying she was being unfair, but she pushed me, and I responded violently and hit her. I hit her head against the beam and then against the kitchen door frame. He's almost presenting it as if he was acting in self-defense. So you felt as if you'd been attacked by Elizabeth? Yes, she attacked me. Johnny Morel refuses to take responsibility for his actions, saying she attacked me and I hit back a bit too hard. It's classic. That's the perversion in him speaking. What does it mean? She attacked the narcissist in him when she said, you're useless, you haven't found me a job. That's why he killed her. I suddenly noticed that she wasn't reacting. When I realized what had happened, I got up and went to be sick. It wasn't my stomach bug that was making me sick. 
was the panic. J'ai vomi parce que j'étais paniqué. Je savais pas quoi faire. I didn't know what to do with the dead body. I thought about pretending she drowned, but I didn't have enough time. So I went to get a plastic bag out of the garage. I put her in the bag, carried her to the garage, and put her in the hole. Then I covered her with earth. But Elizabeth's car was found in Lillebonne, not Lafrenet. Yes, I moved it the next day. I got dressed in clothes I never wear and went to park the car in the car park on Le Clavel estate. I parked it there because I know it's a dodgy area, and I was hoping that if I left the door open and her bag on display, the car would be stolen. That proves just how much thought and skill went into manipulating people and sending us off on the wrong track. I should point out that it was my idea to write a note to throw you off the scent. I scribbled down a date and a time, and I chose Fred, because it's informal and intimate. I wrote the note at home, but I didn't use my right hand. I wrote with my left hand, pressing a bit harder than usual. And at what point did you undress the body? That was when I had the idea of staging a drowning. Yes, I took off her sweater. Elizabeth was found wearing just a bra. She was naked, apart from that item of clothing. That reinforced the notion that her death followed a rape or some non-consensual sexual act. If this was a straightforward murder case, we'd be looking at 20 years in prison. But if this was, as we thought, rape followed by murder, then we'd be looking at a life sentence. The clock is ticking. Morel has confessed to the murder, but convinced that he's also guilty of rape, Vepierre ramps up the pressure. He has very little time left to get a full confession. Mr. Morel, you're still lying to us. The more you lie, the worse it will be for you in court. Magistrates and juries don't like to be taken for fools. And the worst thing isn't the sentence they'll impose on you. It's that your family is going to turn its back on you. First your wife, and then your daughter. Next, I pressed him about his relationship with his sister and with his family. I spelled it out to him. I said, Morel, you have done something terrible. At least have the good sense to acknowledge what you have done. With your attitude, you're going to cut yourself off from everyone. You have no support network. You'll be entirely on your own. Your sisters are still on your side. But if you continue to deny the fact, they'll turn their backs on you. And they'll despise you. So come on, Morel. If there's a modicum of humanity and honor left in you, find the courage to tell me what really happened. And I could see that he was taking on board what I was saying. But he was closed off. He didn't react. Then something unexpected happened. Inspector Alanik came into the room and offered me a coffee. It was 10 a.m. We hadn't slept in over 24 hours. Coffee was most welcome. Yes, I'd like a coffee too, please. And Inspector Alanik shot him a look and said, Not you. No way. And off she went. That threw him. Do you see, Morel? People already despise you. I warned you of that. This is just the start. Now, why don't you stop lying and tell me what happened? I wanted to see her again. I asked her to come to my house at 11 a.m. And it didn't go well. I raped her. That's why she had no clothes on. What went wrong between you? In fact, 
She changed the way she greeted me. She'd started kissing me closer to the mouth, rather than just on the cheeks. So, I thought I could take things further. Do you see, after she'd been in the house for a while, I kissed her amorously. Once he goes into detail and admits what he did, I sense a sort of relief. I think there is a sort of osmosis between us. Communication is established where there was none before, and it feels different. His answers are less considered. I sense that he is telling the truth at this point. When I started caressing her, I felt her stiffen. But I carried on anyway. I was acting on impulse. From then on, I used force and undressed her. She was saying, no, don't do that, stop. And I raped her. Did you have full sexual relations? Yes, but they were forced. She wanted to get up. She said she was going to tell my wife. She tried to leave, and I grabbed her and hit her, the way I described. Boss. The interview came to a rather abrupt end. We'd have liked to have had more time, but we had to report what had happened to the examining magistrate, and he had the case referred straight away. Mr. Morel, we must inform you that we now have enough evidence to charge you. We are going to inform the examining magistrate that we are suspending this interview. Then we will start proceedings to hand you over to the deputy public prosecutor. It's Friday, April 29th, 1998. This last interview, which lasted more than six hours, concluded Johnny's Morel's period in custody in the Elizabeth Griffin case. Incarcerated in Rouen prison, Johnny's Morel attempted suicide that same weekend. Johnny Morel is Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. He is two people in one. The Jekyll side is the adapted side. It controls everything, up to a point. But then another body is found. That's when Mr. Hyde comes to the fore. The side of Morel that is sexually abusive and into pornography. Mr. Hyde starts controlling the adapted side, and the adapted side can't stand it. That's probably when he tried to kill himself. It is 4 p.m., and the police have brought Jean-Yves Morel back to his house, to the scene of his crimes. Last Thursday, he confessed to the murder of a first young woman. This morning, he acknowledged that he also killed his sister-in-law, Marilène Roussy. On the following Monday, May 4th, Jean-Yves Morel was once again taken into police custody, this time in conjunction with Marilyn's disappearance. He immediately confessed to the murder of his sister-in-law. As with Elizabeth, he buried her body, in his garden this time, in a hole he had dug several weeks previously. He's always got a hole ready. It's amazing, but that's just how it is with Morel. He had dug a hole to plant a tree, and he put Marilyn's body in that hole. I think we were dealing with a sexual predator. He was a serial killer in the making. He is the archetypal serial killer. He collects bodies and he is the only one who knows where they are. I don't think he would have stopped there. Jean-Yves Morel's trial began on February 16, 2000, in Rouen's courts of law. It was a very painful time for Nadine, his wife. Lawyers can't use this word, but wives can. I was living with a monster. I actually lived with that man. He was there, in my house. I spent every day with him, and he killed my sister. And I carried on living with him afterwards. 
completely oblivious that he had killed my sister. I supported him and protected him. I defended him to everyone. On February the 18th, 2000, Jean-Yves Morel was found guilty of raping and murdering Elizabeth Griffin and murdering Marilyn Rousset. He was handed a life sentence with a recommended minimum of 22 years without parole, the maximum sentence available on the statute book. In an investigator's career, not every case is noteworthy. You might get one or two, but not 50. This was one of those cases for me. What struck me was how painful it must have been for Mrs. Morel and her family. I think it's definitely one of the best investigations of my career. In the sense that we solved two cases for two families. It was tragic, of course, but I think they were relieved to find out the truth, to be able to stop hoping in vain. I think we all learned to believe in what we were doing and to see things through to the bitter end. 